Ben, is that you? Yeah. Just like hold my hand just a little bit. It's not bad. It's not like okay, hurt. Breathe. Okay. I think I'm really cold too. After tribal, I wake up from a dream and panic mode like kicked in. I have this hysteria for about 50 seconds and I have to calm down from it. It was like a bit of a shock part of it. Yeah. I understood how nuts it was in the moment because I've had panic attacks before. It's like something I can't control. Thank God there were some nice people in the tribe and Kenzie was able to just calm me down. Sorry. Don't be. Take your time. My mom and sister both struggle with anxiety. They struggle with their mental health. So I've been helping people regulate sleep and anxiety before I even knew what that was really. Yeah, thanks, buddy. You know, this is a game where I very easily could have been like, good, don't sleep. I hope you mess up in the challenges, but that, I couldn't, I couldn't. Kenzie held my hand, helped me make a fire, and she made me feel like it wasn't gonna be some kind of like, yo, Ben's being a freak show, back to like the sixth grade vibe. I don't care if it's a game for a million dollars. Like, at the end of the day, Ben's a person. Is he my competition? Yes, but he's my friend. And sometimes you just got to be there for somebody and just sit with them through it. Just be with them through the storm, you know? Sometimes that's all someone needs. Well, I'm super excited to be here. I, this is my first time getting to do anything like this. And so Lynette Rice, come on out. I can't believe it's been 46 seasons, Jeff Probst. Yep, I know. 46. Me either. <laughs> Can we go back to the very, very beginning? How did you get this job? How did you, uh, did you audition? Yeah, well, the short story is that Mark Burnett, I heard him on the radio, uh, on the Jonathan Brandmeier radio show, talking about this crazy idea, and I, I was instantly attracted to it. For the same reasons I am today, I just felt like this is going to be something that goes much deeper than a, you know, some of the other things I was being offered at the time. And so we met for two hours, and we talked, he mostly talked, and I didn't realize it until a couple of years later, he was still figuring the show out when he was talking to me. And he was auditioning it on me. He was basically pitching me to see what I responded to. And then at the end, I was like, well, wait a minute, we haven't talked about me. And I said, I, I, I'm a writer. I'm a student of the human condition. I've been in therapy. I get this show. <laughs> and he said, well, it's very nice to be so honest. Nice to meet you. And I left, and, and that was it. But when I left, I thought, there's only one other guy they could get to do this show, Phil Kogan, who had been hosting. He and I worked together in New York. And five months later, I got called to go back to CBS. They said, it's you and one other person. And when I looked in the sign-in sheet, the other person was Phil Kogan. And so we were definitely, you know, I was definitely in sync with the show. But I'm not kidding when I say I wanted it then as much as I'm glad I'm a part of it now. It's never changed. I have to think you obviously, you grew into the job. Is there a year that you felt like, okay, I've hit my groove right here? No, I'm still finding it, you know, for real. I'm, I mean, I, in the beginning, Mark was really cool. He, and I, you know, if you're ever like working with talent, he gave me permission to find it myself rather than telling me how to say it or telling me where to stand because I have massive authority issues. And instead, he would just say, I trust you. So just do what you think is right. And so he let me sort of, you know, stumble along, but find my own voice so that now, 20, you know, three years later, I feel authentic hosting Survivor. I'm naturally curious, and that's what I bring to it. And then I try to put myself in the, from the standpoint of the audience, what would, what would anybody wonder right now? Like, you're standing so weird with your hand on your hip. What is happening? You know, whatever that natural thing is. So the job is easy in that sense. But as I evolve as a human, I change how I host Survivor. What do you mean you have authority issues? What did that mean? Yeah, just uh, that's deep, deep. Uh, 
you know, I just took a good medicine journey the other day, and uh, we talked about that to my guides up in the, no, I'm kidding. <laughs> no, just meaning like, I, I, you know, I never really liked somebody to tell me how to be on a show. And most shows they do, they want to write copy and they want to put a thing in your ear. Mark never did that. There's never been a writer on Survivor. I've never had an earpiece. There's nothing, it's just a live experience where you get out there with a group of people and you just sort of go and you see where it takes you. And sometimes you're right, sometimes you're wrong, sometimes I'm good, sometimes I'm terrible, but I'm always just in it. And it's the funniest thing is that when I see people and I talk to them, especially if they're in the industry, at some point, they will tilt their head and go, wow, you really love Survivor. You know, like it's, a, like it's a weird thing. And I say, yes, I love human behavior. For me, Lynette, this is the thing. We're, we're called a competition reality show. To me, that's what separates us, is for Survivor, the competition, the game, that's the MacGuffin. That's the misdirect is you come to play the game, and if you're a Survivor fan, you know what that means to find an idol and to run off a big challenge and jump into the water and blindside somebody. But that's the lure. The game is the lure, the experience is the prize. Which is why at the end, when I say, who here feels different? Everybody's like, oh my God, I'm a completely different human after 26 days. You have to play the game to get the experience, but it's not about the game, it's about the journey. And that's the, when I met Mark, I said, this is Joseph Campbell. It's Hero's Journey. And he's like, Joseph Campbell, who's that? And I said, you got to read this dude because that's the show you're making. All these people are going to go on this journey. It's just cleverly disguised. Do contestants, participants, survivors, do they see that now as opposed to that first year when you had survivors first coming to this new show? Do they, I mean, what is the difference between the participants then yeah. versus now? Uh, that's a good question. I mean, a lot of it is our casting, the people we're putting on the show. When COVID hit, George Cheeks, who runs all of CBS, called me, and I'm sure every show producer, and he said, hey, there's a new mandate, and it's not a request. Diversity is going to change at CBS, and 50% of the show has to be BIPOC. That, that will go down as one of the most positive and significant changes ever in Survivor, because it, it wasn't a request. He knew if I give you a request, you won't do it. I'm going to tell you to do it. And then this entire world, Lynette, exploded in front of us with all types of new stories. And what's fascinating is, just to context, we're about to shoot our 24th year. More people are applying now than ever. And it's going up every season. I just got the statistics in every single category, African American. East Asian, Middle Eastern, South Pacific Islander, uh, you know, Latino, Hispanic, Asian, every single type of person, ethnicity, background, is applying to be on Survivor in more numbers. And it's the perfect illustration of what we hear all the time, which is representation matters. Because now we have people applying to be on the show saying, yeah, well, I never saw anybody that looked like me. Now I do. And now I realize I could do it too. I'm, you're obviously seeing people who grew up with this show. Are they walking in thinking, ah, I know exactly what to expect? Yeah, we do. We did graduate to sort of a, you know, you have to know how to play the game. And that took years. And there was a point where, and I was definitely the leader of that idea, which is the game now is like, imagine if you're playing high stakes poker and you have one person that doesn't know if three of a kind beats two pair. You could make an argument, oh, that's interesting, but really they're gonna muck up the game because all the other players are playing at a different level. So occasionally we meet somebody who applies and says, you know, I just saw it and I saw you say apply, so I'm applying, but I haven't seen all the seasons. And we say, well, just do your work because you're gonna get smoked otherwise because the game is important. You have to know how to play the game. So when I say the game's the MacGuffin, you have to play the game and if you wanna win, you have to be great at taking big chances and reading people and understanding emotional intelligence and what's the subtext, look at their body language. You have to do all of that stuff. And when it's over, you're gonna forget the game and you're gonna go, oh my God, I wasn't in Kansas, I forgot. I, you know, That's why when Survivor starts episode one, usually there's mud and sand. So that when the player looks down, they've just got off the boat and they've run this challenge and they look down and they look at each other and they realize, oh, I'm on Survivor. And a storm is coming and we don't have shelter, and there's no food, and we didn't get our supplies, and suddenly it dawns on them, 
I'm not in a television show. I'm in a jungle, and it's freezing. And that's where the transformation starts. That's the, the beginning moment. So you just met some folks in the green room who've been watching it since day one, every freaking episode. So are you saying people like them uh, aren't necessarily going to be excellent competitors, despite the fact that they're huge students of the show? Absolutely. We just had a guy on this season, Banu, a really cool guy. And he, his story is he grew up in India living in a shelter that was worse than the shelter they're going to make on Survivor. And they don't make much on Survivor. I mean, it's some palm fronds. But he loved it, and it, for him it was important. It was a part of him understanding how he was going to be in America when he moved here. But he didn't know how to play. And, and they all saw it, and he was so bad that he started costing other people because now he has information, and he doesn't know I'm not supposed to share it, or whatever the situation. And when he left, it was painful for him. And we, we produced and edited it as though it was a spiritual death, as though he was going through the five stages of grief. It sounds super corny, but if you go watch that episode, that's what you'll see. And if you look at the way we covered it, we covered it with like a big drone shot. So you could just see him alone in the jungle as he looks up to God and says, why did you put me here if you wanted me to fail? So some people see that and they go, oh, what a goofball. I see it and go, that's real emotion. That's true vulnerability. He had this dream and, and he has a relationship with his God and he's asking, why did you put me here if I was going to fail? He's still asking these questions. That's why I still love Survivor is that kind of stuff. I want to go back to what you talked about, like um, narrating the show, saying what you feel. As a viewer, it's awesome because you're clearly saying how you feel, which is great. But I, I feel like I'm projecting here. If I was on the show and I heard you in my ear, I just want to yell, cut the shit, Probst. Yeah. And, and have you ever had that happen with any of the yeah. contestants? Yeah, yeah. And, and it's funny you bring that up because there's, there's two ways of me talking to the players. One is that, which is Lynette, uh, you know, slowing her tribe down, or maybe it's a little saucier than that, but basically just saying, Lynette, pick it the fuck up. And sometimes the player looks back and says, I'm doing my best, probes, once you get out here. <laughs> Other times they panic more because I'm in their head and I'm saying, struggling with the puzzle. And they're like, oh my God, I am. That's on you. You know I'm going to talk. So you can shut me out, you can tell me to be quiet, whatever you want, but I don't feel bad at all. This is part of the game. I'm merely saying what's happening. You are in dead last, and the rest of your tribe, you can't see it, but they're, they're talking about you right now, that you might be going home. That's, the, that's what you're trying to put, because I'm just adding another layer of stress, another ticking clock, hearing my little annoying voice. That's one side. But then the other side is, We'll be doing some long endurance challenge, which are incredibly painful. And in those cases, I am their biggest fan. I am the one saying, Lynette, hang in there longer. Just five more seconds. Just hang in there a little longer. Don't let that other person see you sweat. You don't let them see you sweat. Like, I want them to get the most out of this. So it's both sides. I'm ultimately a huge fan, but I love the interplay with the players. I love it when we banter. I love it when they talk back to me. I love all of that because it makes me feel like I'm a part of the game. Gosh. Uh, now to tribal. One thing that continues to shock me is how people still let it all hang out. They don't hold anything back. Knowing from watching previous seasons, this stuff is going to bite you in the butt. Don't say it. But they always say it. <laughs> How, how are they not learning from past seasons? Well, okay, two parts to that question. The learning thing is something that I, rem I used to hear a lot in the early seasons. People would make the same mistakes. And people would stop me and say, why don't, don't they learn? They're making the same mistakes. And I realized one day they're not making a mistake. It's in their nature. It's a scorpion and the frog. What, you know, I gave you a ride. Why'd you kill me? It's in my nature. So a lot of that is like the person who says, I'm normally a leader, Jeff, and I'm a very good leader, I must say. I'm not going to be a leader on Survivor. You're 100% going to be a leader on Survivor. You're immediately going to tell them how to build the shelter because it's in your nature. But in terms of tribal, that's different. Tribal is a million-dollar event for somebody. Their shot at a million dollars is going to be over. There is so much happening with sophisticated players where you say I'm giving something away, but what you don't know is I'm not. I'm sending a signal to the person down on the end to let them know I'm still with you. So you can never play this game 
and feel that you're safe because history says you shouldn't. The minute you feel you're safe, it's you. So instead, you're constantly looking down, whether it's really looking or in your mind you're listening. You don't want to look because you're afraid what you're going to give away. So that's why people, I don't think they're making mistakes. I think they're, they're taking calculated risk at what I'm going to say is going to either put somebody off the scent that they're the one in trouble or send a signal to somebody I'm aligned with that they are, we're still aligned. I'm going for this person. Um, remember the cold opens, you know, when probes would be hanging out of a helicopter and it looks like he's about to die. <laughs> you remember all those? You, know, you don't do those as much no. anymore. Why not? Well, number, well, we were running out of ideas that were achievable for me. And when it actually, the truth is, we got permission to do one in New York where we were going to land on Madison Square uh, building. And then Batman walk down the side of the building. I'm looking in windows trying to find where the stage is. That was kind of the bit. And it was going to start with me rappelling out of a helicopter landing on the roof. So I was like, that's kind of Tom Cruise. I, that would be pretty cool. I don't know anything. I am not a stunt person. I don't know anything about any of this. We go out in California here where we go out to a stunt place where they do these kinds of things. And there's a whole team there. And we've got everybody's ready to shoot. And we have a helicopter. And I'm talking to the stunt coordinator. And we're walking toward this first rehearsal. And he goes, got to say, really hand it to you. I said, why? And he goes, well, what you're about to do is, is uh, one of the most difficult stunts you can do. And I said, what do you mean? And he said, the helicopter. He goes, look, jumping out of a helicopter into the water, yeah, that's OK. You're rappelling down a rope ladder. And he said, this is extremely dangerous. And literally, I said, hang on. Um, I don't think we should do this shoot. And, and I was out. Because he looked at me like, I don't think the kid from Wichita has any idea what you've stepped into. Because we were just goofballs going, sure, that sounds great. <laughs> yeah, so that's why they stopped. Uh, why hasn't anyone been able to replicate the success that is Survivor? Well, I mean, it starts with the format. The Survivor format is really good. And I've talked to other people who produce it in different countries, and they see the format differently, so everybody has their own take on it. For me, the format is... You take a group of strangers and you force them to rely on each other while voting each other out. Everything else, who knows if that's the format. But if you just take that little box, inside that little tiny box, there's gigantic space to explore. I don't feel like we've even started. There's so many ways we could spin this game. Do you need challenges? Probably, but not necessarily. So I think that's the biggest part. And then I think the other thing is that Survivor is us. It's a reflection of us. If you go back and look at a season from 15 years ago, you will see things we would never do today. But we not only did them then, we celebrated them. And if you see things today, you couldn't have imagined 15 years ago we'd be doing them today. The conversations we're having, the types of people who are playing. So I always, I try to be gracious with myself and the show that I can go back and find lots of episodes and say, eh, I wish I hadn't said that. You know, that's not what I would say today. But that's what I said that day, and that's what aired, and that's what we all thought. So I think that's part of it, is even though we don't know it, Survivor's a weird format in that, yeah, it's a game, and it's all these things, but it's also us. A group of people form a society, and they try to figure it out, and sometimes that storm is real, you know, and sometimes those injuries are painful or close to death, you know, so it's, it's humbling. And then I think our casting is phenomenal, and our storytelling is really good. One last thing. I'm sure in your head, you, there's a handful of all-time great Survivor players. If we had that game today, do you say to yourself, yeah, I could beat them? No. No. No, no for sure. I would not win Survivor. I'm totally aware I would annoy people in so many ways that I think are charming. <laughs> and, and then I would hear the interview and go, oh, oh, okay. So no, I would like to try it because the one thing I'm constantly remind the players is that when you sign up for something like Survivor, you have to remember you're the one in the arena. You're the one who stood up and said, I will go do this. I will try to do this in front of television cameras, aired all over the world. I'm going to be vulnerable, tired, hungry, exhausted. And when you get home, all these other people who will never get up off the couch, they're going to criticize you and they're going to judge you and they're going to say that hat is dumb and that shirt is ugly and you're terrible. You just got to, you know, I say you got to try to not care. Just be you. 
just go do it because it's, yes, it's true. But I mean, people who sign up for Survivor, they're very vulnerable. It's real. There's no joke on Survivor. There's nothing about this is scripted or even loosely implied. We don't mess with the game. We have a really simple format. Our biggest decision is who do we put on the show? And then we lay out the creative, and it, we don't know who's going to do what. Like, Survivor 47 creative is all laid out. It's done. We're going to be shooting in 30 days. We just don't know who's going to do it. There's a thing hidden there. We already know what day it's going on, what time of day. We just don't know who's going to find it, what they're going to do with it. So. I think that's the biggest thing, is that there's just nothing like Survivor. The totally bitchin' Jeff Probst, everyone. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks for having me. <laughs>